Um, you've got to do something. So the leafy green industry created what's called the leafy green marketing handler agreement um, in which um, most of the people who uh, buy and uh, ship uh, leafy greens in California and Arizona uh, essentially require their growers to be audited for food safety purposes. So that's that happened in uh, 2000, uh, end of 2006. Um, and so ever since that point, um, we at CAF have been struggling um, to try to keep this food safety stuff from running all of the smaller farms out of business. Um, and uh, so we worked all the way through the Food Safety Modernization Act and its uh, rulemaking and implementation. But uh, I think we can trace really this food safety stuff back to this moment here in 2006. Uh, next slide. Um, so besides this uh, outbreak in uh, spinach, uh, which was related to uh, water that had been contaminated with manure and was put on the crop, um, there also are a number of other examples of, uh, uh, we're just going to give you some examples of, of different outbreaks that are related to things. Here are some that were related to water. Um, there for, for some years there were problems of salmonella down in the south. Um, they discovered that it was associated with different ponds that people were using to irrigate. Um, Guatemalan raspberries were imported uh, and they traced it back to uh, contaminated water that had been used in a chemical backpack sprayer. Um, was a Shigella outbreak in uh, British Columbia on spinach. It turned out to be associated with the septic tanks uh, that were contaminating the water that was being used. Um, well, it's hard to get this thing to go. <laughs> uh, and then uh, here are some examples of ones that were related actually to em employee health. Um, in 94, uh, green onions, again, Shigella, there were 72 cases reported of illness. Um, and this was uh, essentially people who were sitting in the fields, tying rubber bands around the green onions, bunches. Um, in 97, uh, California strawberries, hepatitis A virus, 250 cases. Um, I've forgotten how that happened exactly. Um, and in 98, uh, again, green onions um, with hepatitis A. Uh, and, and, and again, people bunching um, green onions uh, in, in the fields. Um, and so this, this is an example of, of why uh, FISMA contains uh, employee health and hygiene, uh, you know, things that have to go on. Next one. Hmm. Okay, and then also it's important to uh, talk about wildlife on farms, and it's important for uh, biodiversity, but also there have been some foodborne out, uh, illness outbreaks linked to wildlife, particularly uh, one case in Oregon with uh, E. coli 0157H7 at a strawberry farm where uh, the strawberries were invaded by deer just passing through, but there were deer feces all over and employees and you pickers were not um, trained or instructed on practices to, on safe picking practices essentially. And uh, a bunch of strawberries were picked and then sold at the farmer's market and farm stand and unfortunately made uh, 15 people ill and uh, seven hospitalized and one passed away. Okay, and then there are also uh, outbreaks linked to equipment contamination, and one of the main examples of this happened in 2011 when a uh, listeria outbreak happened in uh, Colorado when cantaloupe were processed through a packing house that had taken an old potato washing machine and converted it to wash 
uh, cantaloupe, and this was a pretty precedent, uh, or a case that's not a precedent because this was the first time that farmers faced criminal charges and the two uh, Jensen brothers were sentenced to probation and six months home detention and fines for the victims, which was unfortunately 147 illnesses. And this was very widespread in a number of states and uh, 33 deaths. So uh, this is important. There's risk all over on the farm, and one area is equipment, and the other areas of employees and water and, and else, elsewhere that we've talked about. And that leads us to uh, manure and, and chemicals, and uh, there was an outbreak linked to shredded lettuce from irrigation water from a well that was contaminated by a nearby dairy lagoon filled with um, for water that had been, you know, contaminated by a bunch of dairy right there in a very in confined area. And then an uh, banned insecticide was used in 1985 on watermelon that, again, the lettuce and watermelon uh, foods people eat raw and they just cut into may or not be washing and then uh, they can become sick. So we talked a lot about a number of different examples, and uh, there, it's unfortunate that all of those have happened. Uh, however, they had kind of led up to the creation of the Food Safety Modernization Act, because until the Food Safety Modernization Act, there was no specific federal uh, requirements for farms for food safety. So here are a few, a few FSMA glossary terms that uh, we'll go over briefly now, but then we will talk about more as we go. So as I said, FSMA uh, is the Food Safety Modernization Act. When we refer to covered produce, that does not mean crops that are physically covered by a row cover or a greenhouse, but that is crops that FSMA regulates. Uh, same thing with a covered farm. A covered farm is a farm that needs to meet certain criteria and abide by parts of FSMA. So we'll talk about what that means. A qualified exempt farm, you can think of that as a partially exempt farm. It's a farm that needs to meet certain criteria to be partially exempt from FSMA requirements. And then lastly, a qualified end user is a consumer or restaurant or retail food establishment that is located in the same state or within 275 miles from the farm. And we're going to talk about this more, so um, don't worry if you're confused. Okay, so a little history on the Food Safety and Modernization Act. In 2011, President Obama signed it into law, and then it was directed to the Food and Drug Administration to implement the law. So they took some time writing out what it all meant, and then there was a two different comment periods where the rule was put out publicly, and thousands and thousands of comments were uh, provided in and adjustments were made. And in November uh, 2015, the final produce rule was released. And there are, it should be noted here that this uh, FSMA overhaul, it doesn't just apply to on-farm food safety. This is an overhaul to food safety across the whole supply chain for the country. This Im impacts people importing produce, this imp impacts transportation companies, um, processors, animal food, human food, um, all sorts of steps along the supply chain. But the one, the, the rules that apply to farms would be the produce rule. And then if any farms are doing value-added processing, they may be subject to the preventative controls rule. This webinar will focus on the produce rule though, but there will be more uh, resources from CAF in the future on value-added processing and preventative controls. So right now, 2017-2018, we are in this regulation implementation phase. Essentially, it's just education and outreach and getting everyone uh, access to and, and, and discussion about what all this means for each farm. So this is great that you're on, on today and, and learning about this. If this is the first time you've heard about it, great. Uh, and thanks for joining us. And then when will this all start to be enforced on farms? The biggest farms could be enforced as early as January 2018. Uh, there's a tiered enfor enforcement timeline based on size of farm so that the smaller farms are, uh, the regulation would be enforced later uh, up to 2020 or beyond. 
And then we also wanted to note that FSMA is not prescriptive. So this may be frustrating for people that are just learning about FSMA for the first time because there's not a lot of specifics on how to be in compliance. For example, what requirements apply regarding pest control in buildings? You must take those measures reasonably necessary to protect covered produce, food contact surfaces, and food packaging materials from contamination by pests in buildings, including routine monitoring for pests as necessary and appropriate. So what is measures reasonably necessary and what is monitoring for pests as necessary and appropriate? That is not explicitly spelled out, which is for the benefit of farms because farms are all different and this provides you with language that you determine what makes sense for your farm and have policies and procedures in place and then you would implement that. Uh, so this is just an example of how there isn't a lot of specifics on how to get um, be in compliance with FSMA. This side. So, um, FSMA exemptions. Okay, so now we're going to talk about who's covered, who's not, what's covered, what's not. So, produce that's not covered by the produce rule um, includes uh, produce grown for personal or on farm consumption. So, anything that you consume on the farm is not covered by FSMA. Secondly, Produce that is rarely consumed raw, that is, FDA has created a list, and we'll show it to you here in just a second, of produce that they think is not often consumed raw. I know, you're not going to agree with all their decisions, but anyway, the list is what it is. It's an exhaustive list. And then third, produce that goes through a kill step uh, that gets processed in some kind of way. So, for instance, wine grapes that are made into wine or uh, processing tomatoes that are cooked and canned. Um, these uh, crops are not subject to FSMA, although you have to basically have a, a letter from the processor saying that, um, you know, that they're taking your crop and, uh, and, and killing the things in it. So, uh, so those, those are examples of, those are the produce that is not covered by the produce rule of FSMA. The other uh, total exemption from FSMA is if you have total annual produce sales from your farm of less than $25,000, and that's in 2011 constant dollars, and we'll get back to that, um, then you are fully exempt from the law. So this is $25,000 and 2011 dollars of produce sales per year. And all of these things are calculated on a three-year rolling average. So the last three years are averaged in order to decide whether you would be exempt or not. But I've had people call up and say, well, you know, I only sell $10,000 a year of this little thing that I grow. Am I exempt? Yes, you're exempt, no matter what you do with it. So, so that's the complete exemption from uh, FSMA. Next. Okay, so here's the list of produce uh, rarely consumed raw. Um, and I'll give you a minute to take a look at it. Um, you're gonna get this uh, PowerPoint so you can study this. If you only sold things that were on this list, then you would be exempt from FSMA. So for instance, if you just produced uh, figs, for instance, uh, you'd be exempt from FSMA, or if you, just produce dill and eggplants and lentils and uh, peppermint and potatoes, you'd be exempt from FSMA. So these crops are, are not covered. That doesn't mean that some buyer might not want you to be applying food safety stuff to this crop, but from the point of view of the federal government, these uh, crops are not uh, dangerous because they're not usually consumed raw. Although all the figs I eat are, are raw. So. <laughs> Um, okay, so you want me to do this one? All right, so the full FSMA exemption, I told you that it was $25,000 in 2011. Okay, and so um, $2011 are a, a, an idea of a constant dollar because we have inflation every year, right? So money is worth less, and sometimes the 
goes up uh, 1%. Sometimes inflation goes up, you know, 3, 4, 5% or whatever, depends. Um, so anyway, a price index adjusts for this. And so FDA is using something that's called the implicit GDP deflator, which is essentially a measure of the overall uh, increase in prices in the economy. So uh, something, right, that was $25,000 in 2011, by 2016, right, 25,020 was actually tw almost $27,000, right, because of inflation. That is, you'd have to have $27,000 paid to you in 2016 to get the same amount of money as if somebody gave you $25,000 in 2011. So anyway, FDA has published uh, this list of numbers, and you can use their published numbers basically to calculate whether or not you're exempt. So. Um, in this case here in 2017, you know, you would average 2014, 15, and 16, right, which averages out to 26,632. And then, uh, you know, you would compare that to the uh, your average of sales in those three years in, in, in dollars that were used at that time. And so that's basically uh, what they're uh, saying um is the is the way that that we're going to do this for these cutoff numbers so i imagine not many people are selling less than twenty five thousand dollars of uh, of produce uh but if they were uh it would be important to pay attention to this but you'll see when we get to the qualified exemption we have the same thing going on Okay, so now after the full exemption, the next category of farms, there's three categories. The first is the full exemption. The second is the qualified exemption. So a farm can be qualified exempt from FSMA if the farm meets two conditions. The first is that you have to have less than 500000 in annual gross sales, and that's the adjusted in $2011. And you need to sell the majority of the food directly to uh, customers, which are the qualified end users that we mentioned earlier. So if you're selling uh, at least the majority, so over 50% of your sales through your farmer's market or a CSA or a farm stand or a restaurant or to an individual grocery store uh, within the same state or 275 miles from the farm and you're under the 500,000, you would be qualified exempt. So we're going to have a number of examples here in a minute to kind of think through this uh, other ways. But just the important thing to remember is if you're qualified exempt, you must meet these two criteria. And again, we have these uh, the dollars adjusted to $2011. And $500,000 really has a wider range when you are looking at it as far as uh, adjusting for inflation. So here the Average 2014 to 2016 is 532,645. So if you're a farm, you would look at your total, all of your food, all of your food sales from the farm in 2014, 2015, and 2016. So that includes other processed products too. It's, so if you are selling uh, lettuce and you're selling dairy all under the same farm name, that would all be the same total dollar each year. And you would then average that 2014, 15, 16 totals, and then see if you're under this $532,000 threshold. If you are, and you saw at least half uh, of it, at least more than half of your sales to a qualified end user, then you would be uh, qualified exempt. So if your farm fits into this category, you might be thinking to yourself right now, what do I have to do? So there's four main things. The first thing you need to do is to keep records to prove you're exempt. So you have to meet those two conditions, right? So how are you going to show and demonstrate that you're under 500000 You'll have your sales receipts, uh, invoices, tax records, whatever financial records you want to use um, that are legitimate. And then you need to prove that at least the majority of your sales are to a qualified end user. So when I talk to farms, I try and get a sense of where all they're selling and say, for example, a farm is selling 70% of their sales, 70% of their $200,000 each year go to their CSA. So that 70% of their sales is really important for them to have documentation to prove that 70% of their sales go to the CSA because that 
helps prove that they sell at least half to the qualified end user. And then that along with the total sales under 500,000 would demonstrate that they're qualified exempt. So the California Department of Food, Food and Agriculture or CDFA may uh, contact farms and ask them to prove that you are qualified exempt. And if so, you would have 24 hours to provide uh, these records. And then it's important to note that uh, the regulations stated that these records needed to begin being kept in March 2016. So if you uh, are not having, don't have these all together right now, uh, this is just letting you know that. And hopefully these are records that you would be able to, you still have them on file. It's just a matter of getting, pulling them together and putting them in one place where you would have them easily accessible moving forward. Okay, the second thing you need to do is to provide the name and address of the farm where the food was grown at the point of sale. So if you're selling at a farmer's market, you would have your farm name up and you'd have the business address of the farm. If it's a CSA box, the boxes would need to have the farm name or um, farm name and the business address on the box. Uh, likewise, you, you see the examples there. If you're dropping off a box of tomatoes at your local grocery store, you don't need to require, you don't think you need to have the grocery store post on the shelf for, for people shopping the name and the farm address. That's not necessary. What the law requires is for you to make sure you're who you're delivering it to knows your farm name and your business address. So having that on the box when you get, bring it to the grocery store would be sufficient. Okay, and then the third thing you need to do is to have well, it's simply like a one piece of paper that has that you've spent at least once a year, you've annually reviewed your FISMA status, and you can prove that you are still qualified exempt. And then you state the date that you did this activity and you went through your records and you signed and dated it. And then lastly, this is just kind of the catch all that. Even though you're qualified exempt from FSMA, the FDA still has the oversight that if it's suspected that your farm is involved in a foodborne illness outbreak, um, they can show up and ex inspect and look all over your farm um, because everyone, no matter where what, what category you fall in for FSMA, um, cannot put adulterated food or contaminated food into the marketplace. So um, everyone needs to be keep that in mind. Okay, and then these four uh, main action items that are in place for qualified exempt farms, when do you need to do this by? Well, if you're a qualified exempt farm that falls in the $25,000 to $299,999 range, you would have until 2020. If you fall in that $250,000 to $499,000 range, you would have until uh, 2019. But a lot of that's pretty simple. I mean, I would imagine just for marketing sake, you're going to want to have your name on all your products, especially if you're selling them direct to customers. Um, so it's not too burdensome putting this together. It's just a little bit of record keeping. Yeah, and so the new farmer's market regulations, um, which are due to come out any time now, um, will require you to have a posted a sign at the farmer's market, which has the name and county of the farm, and the FDA has decided that at farmer's markets that's sufficient. But if you have, uh, if you have uh, like packaged things that you're selling or whatever, you really need to put the name and full address of the farm on that. Um, okay, so here are some uh, scenarios. Um, whether you're fully exempt, qualified exempt, or fully subject to FISMA. Uh, and so over in the left column here, it says uh, that the fully exempt farms, right, uh, and gives the various ways that you might be fully exempt. And then the next column are qualified exempt farms. Um, and these are the two things that Kaylee just discussed that you have to meet. Um, you know, you have to be under this sales level and you have to sell more than half directly to a qualified end user. There's gonna be lots of small farms that are not qualified exempt because they don't sell more than half of this stuff to a qualified end user. If you sell a lot of wholesale to a packing house or something, uh, for instance, if you were a strawberry grower and everything went to the cooler, 
Well, then I'm sorry, you're subject to all of FISMA. So um, let's go through some of these scenarios. So the first scenario, um, uh, Adam's farm grows a bunch of vegetables and sells them at his farm stand. His total gross annual sales of produce are less than 25,000. Uh, oops, what happened there? <laughs> <laughs> okay, there we go. Uh, right, and so because his total annual sales uh, are less uh, than twenty-five thousand of produce, it's very confusing, right? Some of this stuff is gross sales, some is produce sales, but this twenty-five thousand one is produce sales. Um, he's uh, exempt from uh, FISMA. Okay, the second one, uh, Susie's farm grows potatoes, eggplants, dried beans. She grosses $45,000 annually um, because she's just growing things that uh, are on that FDA list of stuff seldom uh, eaten raw. Uh, she's exempt from FISMA, even though she has sales of more than $45,000 of produce. I think you have to click on it and then hit that thing. Okay, scenario three. Okay, Garrett's farm grosses 80,000 annually from growing only tomatoes that are all sold to a processor and turned into a tomato sauce. So as we mentioned before, um, he would be exempt from FISMA, right? Because these tomatoes are being processed. That is, they go through a kill step. So he would need to get a letter from the processor stating that they were buying these tomatoes and processing them. And that would be sufficient record uh, to keep of it. Okay, fourth scenario. Alexa's farm grows a diverse amount of fruit and vegetables that are all eaten by her family on the farm. So again, because everything is consumed on the farm, she's exempt from FISMA. Food that is consumed on the farm is exempt from FISMA. Scenario five, Joe's farm has $200,000 of total gross sales annually and sells 150,000 of the sales through his CSA and farmer's markets. Okay, so He's under the $500,000 level, and he sells um, three quarters of it uh, directly to qualified end users. So he has a qualified exemption from FISMA, um, right? Because he satisfies both of those criteria of selling less than 500,000 gross sales in 2011 dollars and selling more than 50% directly to qualified end users. Scenario six, Taro's firm, farm has 100,000 gross annual sales and 80,000 is made by selling strawberries and tomatoes to a distributor. The other 20,000 is from farm stand sales of strawberries and other vegetables. So here's an example, even though Taro's farm is selling less than $500,000, uh, she's selling the majority of the produce to a distributor. Uh, and so um, she's not selling a majority directly to the public or a qualified end user. So she would be subject to the complete FISMA rule. Okay, so now, okay, so now we're going to try something to see if this works on your end for the audience. We've got a scenario seven here that we're going to send out a poll. So this should pop up on your screen. Read through this example on uh, I'll read it as well, that scenario number seven is that Jenna's farm is a large CSA farm with 600,000 in annual sales with 580 from CSA. The other 20 is made from sales to restaurants. So you have hopefully on your screen three options popped up. You can select fully exempt, qualified exempt, or fully covered for this uh, scenario. What do you guys think about where does Jenna's farm fall here. So remember, we've got the qualified exempt two criteria here on this table. So I'll give you another second here. All right, we've got a bit more to cover. So we're going to do great. So we can see here that Thank you for participating. You 
Um, everyone who answered fully covered, you are correct. And that is because while this farm sells all of the sales to a qualified end user, there are over there is over five hundred thousand dollars in sales. So no matter if you sell all of it to a qualified end user, um, that doesn't matter because you're over that five hundred thousand. So this this farm would be fully covered. Okay. Uh, we're running a little short on time, so I think we're going to continue. Well, for scenario number eight is Debbie's farm, and Debbie's farm has the following breakdown. So $250,000 from dairy and two hundred fifty from grain and $50,000 from value-added products and $5,000 from farm sand strawberries. So um, let's we're going to do another poll. Let's, we're going to continue for this one for right now. Um, this farm is again over the 500,000, so um, they would be fully covered as well. Of note here though is that there's only $5,000 of uh, fresh produce being sold, uh, but they would still be subject to the whole law because they're over the 500,000. Okay, so now we... Um, yeah, so we... Uh... We have some examples of uh, small farms that have a qualified exemption from FISMA uh, here in California. We put down a few. So uh, people who mainly sell at farmers markets or through a CSA or at their farm at a farm stand, these people, um, you know, if they're under half a million in 2011 dollars, uh, they likely, um, whoops, they likely have a qualified uh, exemption. Um, for example, like the Southeast Asian strawberry growers around Sacramento, the Mien growers, they sell most of those strawberries at farm stands that they put right out by their fields. So they would be exempt unless they sold more than a half million dollars. Um, or growers uh, up uh, in Sonoma or Yolo County uh, who sell a lot of specialty items to restaurants in the Bay Area. Restaurants are qualified end users. And so if they sell a majority to that and less than half a million, they would have a qualified exemption or farms that are set up to supply a particular store or restaurant. Um, for instance, uh, in Napa, there are a bunch of gardens, right, that just supply restaurants, or uh, Byright Market in San Francisco has its own farm. Um, there's a number of examples of that sort of thing. Um, if they're selling all of this to a particular store or restaurant and it's less than a half a million dollars, um, they would have a qualified exemption. And then here's some examples of uh, small farms that uh, will be fully subject to FISMA. I think I mentioned earlier, for instance, strawberry growers um, who sell to shippers like Driscoll's or Giant or WellPicked. Um, since uh, they're financed by those people and all their product goes to them, uh, they're fully subject to FISMA. A lot of the Hmong vegetable growers around Fresmo, for instance, uh, sell to packing houses. Um, and so uh, they would be fully subject to FISMA, no matter how, how small their sales were. Similarly, uh, raisin grape growers around Fresno, um, all of that, uh, all those raisins uh, basically go into packing houses. Um, and so they would be subject to FISMA because there's no the kill step is simply dried out in the field. Um, and tree fruit growers uh, who sell the packing houses, they're all going to be subject to this. Or, for instance, a group of Chinese growers that we've worked with south of, of San Jose. We were trying to give some examples of some uh, ethnic groups. Great, thanks. So we went over the fully exempt farm categories and then just went over the qualified exempt. So what's left are farms that are fully covered and subject to the entire law. And we're not going to dive into all the details of what those farms will have to do in this webinar. We have future webinars planned on the topic and in-person trainings. But the main high-level overview is that one person or supervisor from the farm must complete an FDA-approved training. And right now, there's only one training called the Produce Safety Alliance, which is an eight-hour day of PowerPoint and a binder of resources on food safety that the attendee gets to take. CAF will be offering these trainings in late 2017 and planning to charge about $100. There's many other groups out there offering these but they um, may, may be charge, charging more. Um, so 
That's just one note of is that there's, like I mentioned earlier, FISMA is not very prescriptive on a lot of things, but one thing that is very specific for farms that are fully subject to the law is that they must get this training requirement. And then also farms will have to meet certain requirements in record keeping, worker health and hygiene, natural resources, wild and domestic animals, crop nutrient, water testing, harvest and post-harvest. So the, the bottom line here is that if you are thinking right now that your farm may be or is a fully covered farm, this is great that you're on this webinar today and learning about this. Um, CAF is here to help support you and want to help guide you through this process. So I believe that takes us to, okay, and lastly, we, we have our, our timeline for compliance. So farms that are fully subject have uh, a tiered approach as well. So if you're a farm that's over 500,000, sometime in 2018 would be the beginning of compliance. If you're in the 250 to 499, again, 2019 and 2020 for the lower tier. Okay, and then, Okay, so there are some requirements that are in those topics I mentioned before, and then FISMA has some recommendations, and these are that farms have a food safety plan and they conduct a risk assessment. Uh, we have templates for this for risk assessments on our, our website with the URL listed here. FISMA does not require farms to get a third-party food safety audit. However, the preventative controls section of FISMA requires aggregators or distributors to meet certain supplier verification uh, criteria. And one way that is met is by the, by buyers requiring their farmers they buy from to get a third party audit. There are other ways this can be met, but there's some confusion amongst that. So if you have specific scenarios um, related to this, you can reach out to CAF and we can help answer your more detailed questions. Oops. Okay, um, and then, Lastly, if you are an organic farmer, you might be wondering if there's any similarity between these food safety requirements and what you're already doing for your organic certification. And the short answer is yes, there is a lot of overlap and you're already on a good track because you're used to keeping records and having documentation of your processes and your systems. The one, There's two main areas though that food safety goes beyond organics and that's in your worker health and hygiene section and in your water. So in the next webinar, we will be diving more deeply into these requirements. If anyone here today is at a farm that will be fully covered under FISMA, I highly recommend that you join us for the next webinar, which leads us to our next polling question, which is that, um, it should show up on your screen here, what category, after we just talked about fully exempt farms, qualified exempt farms, and fully covered farms, who on this webinar today, where do you think the farm you own or the farm you work at or farm that you provide support to or work with, where do you think they fall along this three types of farms? We'll give you all a second to think about it. It's okay if you don't know 100%. We just went through a lot of information, but this is just to try and get a sense of what everyone here today, their farms are. Okay, so interesting, we've got a, a good spread here of farms in every category. So we will um, close out of that and it makes that happen. So half the people say they're fully covered. Yeah, so half the people say they call it fully covered. Some people are fully exempt and some people are qualified exempt. So the fact that there's a bunch of people who are fully covered, um, it will be important um, to make sure that you have started working on food safety practices and uh, that you recognize what your obligations are because uh, CDFA is creating a list of all the farms, qualified exempt and uh, covered farms, but they're particularly interested in the covered farms and they will start inspecting people at the end of 2018. So, you know, you have uh, probably a year and a half from now uh, to get completely up to speed uh, if you're fully covered. If you're qualified exempt, you, you know, they may show up at your farm, but you just have to prove to them that you have this qualified exemption. So, um, although I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a caveat on that in a second because of California laws. 
Um, so uh, the direct marketing laws in California have all been changed um, in one way or another. And there's a CSA law, farmer's market law, and an urban garden law. And uh, they all include an obligation to implement good agricultural practices or basic food safety practices on the farm. So if CDFA were to show up on your farm, even if you were qualified exempt or completely exempt, and you were selling at a farmer's market, for instance, um, you, every year you have to sign a uh, thing when you get your CPC. And uh, it says there, I certify I'm knowledgeable and intend to produce in accordance with good agricultural practices as published by the department. So we've clarified that that doesn't mean you have to follow their good agricultural practices. They have a little brochure on their website, but you have to demonstrate that you've implemented food safety practices on your farm. And the way to do that, of course, is to do a risk assessment of your farm and then figure out what are the ways to minimize uh, food safety risks. Um, so, uh, so there's really no uh, escaping food safety uh, in California. Uh, the California law basically requires everybody uh, engaged in direct marketing um, to do that. Um, So did did you look at the questions? Is there something we should be answering there? We can wait. Okay, so if anyone on this webinar is not familiar, we wanted to do a little bit of an overview of, of GAPS or good agricultural practices. So as Dave just mentioned, there are new direct marketing laws and uh, it's important for all farms, no matter what fi category FISMA puts you in, to be implementing uh, good agricultural practices. And there's five main areas where this happens on a farm, and that's in water and employee training, land use and animal access, equipment, tools, and buildings, and then manure, compost, and chemicals. It's very similar to that same list that FISMA goes over for farms that are fully subject to the whole law. And if you are new to this, we recommend that you can uh, download our risk assessment on the website, and it's a simple yes, no for different uh, questions on these topics on your farm, and you can you can start somewhere and, and figure out how or what of these categories you should prioritize first, where you um, can help reduce the risks, the greatest return on changing your practices or changing your systems to help reduce risk, food safety risks. So again, uh, Farms are, there's no such thing as zero risk on farms. We all know they're inherently um, inter interlinked with nature and with soil and bacteria and everything around us, but it's important that you recognize that you can minimize some um, risk. Okay, so we just went over a lot and uh, how does it all fit together? So, all farms in California must uh, implement good agricultural practices. And then of the farms in California, some section of these farms will be fully exempt. Some section will be qualified exempt. And some group will be fully covered. And then some farms may be required to get third-party audits by their buyers. And then farms in all these categories may be, might be organic and subject to organic regulations. And then if your farm's doing any value added products, there's additional regulations. So this is just kind of an attempt to have a visual overview of how this all fits together. So with that, I think we're going to pause and take a look at our questions and thank our funders. And if you had a question but you haven't typed it in yet, now would be a great time to type it in. So the answer is yes. Oh, you said that. Okay. How does a how does a farm to table restaurant determine if they are exempt? If annual restaurant sales exceed the threshold numbers, but the ingredients include the restaurant's own produce along with meats, dairy, vegetables, we don't purchase our produce from ourselves. Yeah, well, I think you would you would value the uh, produce. You would have to figure out how to value the produce, um, and then um, right because you're not you're not the restaurant isn't a farm, um, so the, the the it would be the farm the value of the farm produce going to the restaurant. 
But you know, that's one of those things that is going to have to be clarified by the FDA. So I, I tell you, we'll we'll send that question to the FDA and see if we can get an, a, a definitive answer on it. What kind of irrigation systems were being used when contamination from irrigation water occurred? Um, well, it depends on on which thing we're talking about. Um, there were different uh, systems in different places. So, um, yeah, I think there there was some sprinkler irrigation. Uh, there was some drip irrigation. Um, I think basically the, the 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 there is a provision by FISMA that if you're using buried drip. Um, you can sort of assume that you're not contaminating the crop uh, with water. Uh, but apart from that, um, you know, the water rules are going to apply. And along those lines with the berry drip, if you're doing berry drip on a root crop, then it, the water is going to touch the edible portion of that crop, whether it's the potato or carrot. So then um, there is some risk still involved in that. But in general, if your irrigation system is drip, it's less risky from a food safety standpoint than overhead irrigation that's um, going everywhere. Yeah, so he, he, here, this last question. So we have a question that says, can produce sold for wholesale that goes through a kill step, like apples for cider, be subtracted from the 50% wholesale requirement? Good question. <laughs> she gives it to me. Um, well, uh, un unfortunately, unless we're looking at the 25,000 exemption category, which is just produce sales, the other the other uh, things are, uh, you know, total sales from the from the farm. So you have to be under 500,000 of total sales of every sort of thing, and that includes stuff that goes to a processor, like cider, or goes to a winery or anything. It all has to be added together and get under the uh, 500,000. And then the question is, um, uh, of the produce that you're selling, um, you know, is is uh, more than 50% being sold to a qualified end user? So the the stuff that went to a processor uh, would be just like stuff that went to a wholesaler. It's not going to a qualified end user, so it's still going to count. And it's going to count on that wholesale side of the equation. Thanks, Dave. And I would just add to that. So if you're only selling apples and that's all you sell and you don't sell any other crop, um, then as Dave mentioned, you would need to make sure you're getting that attestation or written document that is from the processor explaining that it's going through a kill step. We've got, we just got another question here and I, we realize we're at time. So if those of you need to jump off, feel free to, but we're gonna keep going for a couple of minutes here while we've got questions. How to download the and if you do need to go, uh, this is just a reminder that you can download these slides. If you go to the handouts tab on the webinar module on the right hand side and you click the triangle, it'll collapse down and show you a, a link to click that PDF, does FISMA apply to your farm? So, and you're also will be sent an email after uh, this webinar in the next week or so with these resources. So this other question here is, is there a definition of what on-farm consumption means? For example, if you have an on-site restaurant, would that be considered on-farm consumption for purposes of being exempt? Okay, so on-farm, on-farm consumption needs to be without an exchange of money. So I'm assuming that there's an exchange of money happening at that restaurant, so that would not be considered on-farm consumption. That This exemption was put into the law for uh, like homesteaders or people that are just having a, a garden for their, their own um, families to eat. So let's see here. I think we've addressed the main, all the questions in the queue, but I'll just give somebody... If anyone else has a last question, give you a few seconds to type it in. You were going to unmute them. All right, and I will unmute the attendees in case somebody is having trouble typing in.
Motion. I apologize. It looks, like, it looks like we're having some trouble unmuting the attendees. So uh, if you can type in your question, if you have any more. So we just got another question on what are the steps in getting a third party certificate? So this is probably in reference to our mention of the third party food safety audit, audit which the steps for that depend on what third party audit you want to get. There are a number of them out there. We have a web page on it on our website about third party audits. You can get one through the USDA, through the California Department of Agriculture, called a good agricultural practice audit or a gap audit. And then there's a number of private companies such as Primus or um, Global Gap and others that will offer them. And there's all sorts of levels of hierarchy of more advanced. Um, so that is something we can talk more of. Yeah, but you don't want to get a third party audit unless somebody demands it of you. And even then you should question it, right? Because it's probably going to cost you 1500 bucks um, every time you get one. So um, the price of the US government ones are doubling. And so it's, it's not going to be an inexpensive proposition anymore. Um, there's a question here, what documents FDA wants to see? Uh, they want you to prove whatever it is that you're trying to prove. So those documents can be in paper, they can be electronic, um, but you have to basically be able to prove to them. Uh, for instance, if you have a qualified exemption that you sold more than half of, uh, of everything from your farm to qualified end users, and, uh, you know, and that your total sales were less than $500,000 in 2011 dollars. So, Basically, whatever documents or whatever records or whatever spreadsheets uh, that you need to prove these things, um, that's what they're going to want to see. And in California, the inspections will be done by CDFA. It will not be FDA coming out to inspect you. And they're able to work with you. Uh, they're not going to come out and just punish people. They're going to come out and try to help you get into compliance. So if you don't have the right documents, they're going to tell you, what you need to put together, and then they're going to either come back or get you to send the stuff to them. So uh, FDA will appear on your farm only if you're making people sick or if you're doing something that people think is just egregious in terms of food safety. Food hub coverage. Oh boy, food hub coverage, that's a big question. So the question is, what about food hub coverage? The short answer is that we're waiting for the FDA to clarify this because they gave specific examples of different qualified end users, but Food Hubs was not one of them. Um, not knowing more about the person who's asking this question, it, it depends on the structure of the Food Hub. If a Food Hub is buying the food and then reselling it versus uh, just uh, connecting buyers with sellers and not actually exchanging the financial value of the food in in their in the interaction if they're more of just brokering there's some questions on how that will all shake down at this point and uh, CAF and other organizations have been very um, persistent with trying to get FDA to provide clarity on this topic because it's a, it's a really big issue that we need to um, know how they're going to regulate it also depends on the ownership of the food hub. If the farmers own the food hub, or it's, I can't remember, there's some share of a large share of it or something, majority, majority uh, then then it it, it probably um, you know is is uh, considered part of the farms essentially and will escape um, preventive controls. Um, but uh, again, this is like a gray area uh, that still needs some, uh, the FDA has been very slow with guidance. So we have another question here. Will handlers and facilities covered under the preventive controls rule be required to ask for third party audits from farmers? Third party, they, they're required to do supplier verification. So they have to verify that their suppliers are in fact following food safety practices, right? But the, those suppliers only have to follow the food safety practices that they're obligated uh, to follow under FISMA. So if you have a qualified exemption as a farm, you're only obligated, um, you know, to do what is required of you. And so they come to you and they say, well, I, I need you to have a third party audit. 
Well, that's not what the law says. The law says that you can essentially write a letter and tell them that you're doing food safety practices on your farm and that that's uh, sufficient. Uh, but of course, it's up to the buyer. If the buyer says, no, I want everybody to have an audit, then then if you want to sell to them, you'll have to have an audit. And again, um, you know, it's they're not paying for the audit, at least so far. Uh, there are very few companies have been willing to pay for the audits for their growers. So it'll be a cost to the to the grower. So we've basically tried to in, encourage people to make sure that you have to have an audit before you have one because, um, yeah, because what? There's lots of confusion. Yeah, there's it's a confusing thing. Um, but one organic distributor sent out a letter and said, everybody has to do global food safety initiative and uh, they all need to be audited. And so we sent that to FDA and I think FDA contacted them and told them, well, that's not completely accurate. So um, so farmers need to know that they have uh, options. Wow, these are a lot of really great questions. Thanks to you all for typing them in and hopefully we have addressed your main questions here and I've taken down a few notes on specific topics and follow-up points to these questions to include in the follow-up email that will go out to you all. I think at this point we're over time, but thanks to all of you for sticking with us and uh, hopefully this has been helpful. Uh, I think we'll end it here for today, but then just to recommend that you take note of the website and feel free to go to CAF's website and food safety pages and look for more resources on this. And then also keep an eye out for promotion about future webinars that go into uh, FISMA more, more specifically. And also let's go see if this, again here, my contact information is just Kaylee, K-A-L-I at CAF.org. Feel free to email me, uh, reach out if you have any questions. I, this is the best part of my job is working with growers and food system advocates to figure out answers to things. And um, I just want to help support you. So feel free to reach out. Okay. Well, thanks to everyone and have a good rest of your afternoon and try and stay cool. Take care. <laughs>